So today we're going to be answering beginner questions. Now, sometimes when you're starting in beekeeping, it can be a bit intimidating to ask questions because it's all new and all different and sometimes your questions might seem silly, but this is the time where there's no such thing as a silly question. Put your questions in the comments below and I'll answer them. Meanwhile, we'll also have some honey from this flow hive. So questions in the bottom and uh, Leah, who's one of our amazing um, customer support representatives will be reading those questions out for us to answer. Now if you look in this hive here you can see there's bees in the window on the honeycomb surface. Now you can see even one doing a waggle dance here. <coughs> see this waggle dance here where it's shaking its bottom and it's walking around on the comb surface. Now I'm just watching that in amazement because what that is telling the rest of the bees in the hive is that the nectar is is uh, let's have a look at the waggle it's waggling for a, about uh, two seconds a time which means it's about two kilometers of distance the nectar or pollen source away so the bees have this amazing uh, method of communicating which is incredible any questions, put them in the comments below. What we're going to do is harvest a little bit of honey here as we go because the honey is coming in here and it's a beautiful thing. This is the frame we harvested last week, if anyone saw that, and the bees are filling that back up again. They do their amazing work of chewing away the capping, fixing up the cells, and the process starts again quite quickly if there's nectar around and your hive's nice and strong. This is one we didn't harvest. This is what's harvested the week before. You can see the colour difference between the different honeys in the hive, which is one of the many benefits of harvesting in this way, is you can isolate these different flavours and enjoy sharing them. Okay, in order to harvest some honey, I'm just going to take the little cap out of the top here, insert this key in like this, and then I'm just going to turn it. And what that does is create channels inside the comb. If you want to harvest a bit, you can, in, you can insert the key just a little way. If you want to harvest more, you can insert the key further. So I'm going to do that now and go ahead and harvest the whole frame of honey. And what you're seeing now is the honey dribbling down here into the trough at the bottom and out of the hive. So there's this beautiful gold honey which I can't wait to taste just coming down the tube now and soon it'll be starting to fill the jar. Any questions put them in the comments below. If anyone is just tuning in this is the the day we do the beginner questions so this is dedicated to there's no such thing as a silly question lots of people have questions it's totally normal everybody starts as a new beekeeper at some stage and it's up to us as experienced beekeepers to support the new ones coming along and, and in doing so, we help them uh, with, with their journey to becoming a beekeeper in this fascinating um, pursuit. Okay, good questions. Hayden is that. from the Sydney metropolitan area and is wondering if he should use two brood boxes instead of one. Okay, in Sydney, um, you could take some advice from some local beekeepers, but you could probably do either. Now, if you have uh, a, a single brood box and a super on like this, that's the way I like to run my hives. It does mean that once they build up and are really strong inside the hive, it, you might need to take a split, otherwise they'll split themselves and swarm. So I like to run them smaller, nice and easy to manage, um, and then split them and get another hive, which is a fantastic thing. If you don't want it, somebody else will. Some beekeepers like to do it differently, might help to limit swarming swarming perhaps they're in in an area where there's a bit of a, a cold climate and um, you need some honey stores to last the winter in which case you might want to have another brood box or another honey super to to give them a bigger hive and more stores for that winter this is beautiful honey so just to point that out to any beginners watching that the question was should they have two boxes like this or or another box which could be another bottom box where where the babies are the brood box or another honey box where the honey is stored 
Eli is having trouble getting bees to go up into the flow super. Okay, so if if that happens, you've 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 got your colony, you put your flow frames on top, and you're not getting much activity, then there's there's a, a trick you can use, which is just basically to get some bird comb off your frames in the the bottom box. You can scrape it off the top or wherever you find it. If it's a um, strong colony, they should be building up a bit of comb, and you just press it into the comb surface. And when you do that, what happens? is the bees go that's not supposed to be there and they start chewing it up and redistributing it around in the area where you put it so bees do recycle the wax and it's what's going to be happening right here on this comb surface we're looking at this is the frame we are harvesting from and you can see the bees are going about their business they're starting to uh they're starting their, their process of chewing away at the cappings already ashley is getting um, bees this week and asks how long should we wait after we put the nuke in before we inspect the hive okay um, the after putting the nuke in um, it dep depends a bit but what I would do is probably leave them for a week I put some new, brand new frames in put your nuke in leave them for a week and and then have a look and make sure if you're drawing natural comb that they are building on the comb guides. If they're building on the comb guides, then um, that's fantastic. And then you don't have to worry. Um, uh, once you get them building nice and straight, then you can let them fill out the entire box and then put your honey super on. We've got a case where the bee just went into this jar, which happens sometimes. I'm just going to fish that out with this hive tool. The bees will be okay. I'll just put it around at the entrance. Now, at the same time, I'm gonna swap this jar over because it's nice and full. Okay. So, we're actually right in the flight path here and this hive can be a little toey sometimes. They, they uh, so that's why I've got my bee suit on at the ready if, if, if one starts to give me a warning buzz. If you're new to beekeeping, make sure you do wear your bee suit and make sure you do um, uh, safety first, read our safety instructions. Some hives can be a little more um, uh, aggressive as, and, and other hives not so. So it's about learning about beekeeping, learning about how that changes in hives and acting accordingly. Any more questions? Dean's asking, is it unusual to see 50 or so hive beetles in the white plastic inspection tray in an otherwise healthy hive? We have olive oil in there, so most of them are dead, but it seems like a fair lot of beetles over about two weeks. Okay, we get that here in this area. So it depends, um, depends on what's normal in your area, I suppose. There are times of the year, especially Especially when it gets a bit humid, actually, the beetles go crazy and we will be catching 50 at a time in the tray at the bottom. Um, a strong colony is okay and often doesn't need you to catch any beetles at all. A weak colony, however, can run into an issue where the beetles take over, lay their, la their, their eggs in the hive and it, it uh, turns into a big beetle home instead, which is the end of the hive. Um, so, so it's when colonies are weak, make sure you do catch the beetles. The flower hive too has a nice tray in the bottom to do that. Kevin is asking, should he feed in between freezes? Temps are going down to 32 at night and mid 50s and 60s for a couple more weeks. Okay. Um, be interesting to know whereabouts in the world you are and actually whereabouts in the world our, our listeners are if, if people want to chime in it's really interesting to know um, so if um, you're wondering about feeding a typical strategy for feeding is when you're trying to build up some stores for a winter to come which is a long period in some places with, with not many flowers so if you've got a long cold winter not many flowers then you might like to feed so the bees have enough stores to get through that time. Now, um, if you've left it later 
and it, the winter time's upon you, then um, it's still better to feed than let your bees starve, but it's actually better to give them stores that they can use during the winter. If you can, if they haven't managed to build up honey stores, you can give them some. Now, um, there's more information on wintering on our website. Now, you can see here the different um, different patterns in the frames. That one's not quite full. We harvested that last week. This one's currently harvesting, and this one is full. So you get this beautiful view here of all of the of what's going on in your hive and you can even watch the bees fill the cells with nectar with their tongues if you have a really close look at that. It's um, really quite useful. Steve's in central Wisconsin has six hives and no honey this year. Um, there was wet weather. Do you know why they'd have no honey? Six hives, no honey. Mm. Um, Okay, um, it'll be interesting to, to ask around other beekeepers and see how they did. Sometimes you do get seasons, just like in any scenario, that for whatever reason isn't um, good for collecting enough nectar. Sometimes you get into a situation where it's too wet and they can't forage. Other times it's too dry and there's not enough flowers. So like any good uh, agricultural pursuit, it's going to be quite weather dependent. Um, let us know how you go and be interesting to know whether you got honey last season. Stephen would like to know, will a flow hive work in a tropical area? So, a, uh, a certainly will do. So flow hive will work in a tropical area. We have, this is a subtropical area. We have plenty of hives in, in tropical areas as well. And we also have them in cold places, even as, as far as um, Norway and Canada and, and places like that. I'm just going to get a little honey in my cup of tea here this morning um, because I can. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, that will probably do it. Good, good. It's a beautiful flavour. Aaron and Melanie are in Perth and installed a nuke six weeks ago and is finding they get chased by the guard bees on some days. Do they need to requeen? Okay. So some beehives will be a bit more aggressive. Now, if you're finding that, um, yes, the answer is to requeen. Now, th that process involves getting in your bee suit, taking the hive apart, finding the queen and replacing her. So that's a, a pretty advanced thing to do. If you need help doing that, then I suggest you do get that from a more experienced beekeeper. Um, we've got lots of videos on showing you how to do brood inspections. And I better change this jar of honey and uh, also tips on how to spot queens but it's, if it's a really busy hive that's getting a little aggressive then that'll be um, a bit of a job in itself to get in there and just find the queen so get some help if you need it uh, we had a few questions that were messaged to us on facebook earlier um, a lot of people were wanting to know how do you know whether a frame is fully capped and ready to harvest without removing the frame? Okay, if you have a look at this window back here, we can go over that now. It's not, um, it's not completely fail safe, but it's pretty good because what you're seeing here is the honey in the actual cells. You're seeing a cross section of what's going on in the frame. The bees are filling out these cells here and when it's ready they stick their wax capping over the top because what they're trying to do is store honey for later when they might need it. If you want to store honey the moisture content needs to be below 20%. So the moisture content in this honey here that isn't ready, they're still filling that frame after we harvested it last week. So the moisture content of that honey isn't quite, quite low enough yet, it might be at 25%. But by the time they fill up the cells, they'll, they'll keep reducing that water content down to 20, below 20%, and then they'll put their wax capping on. If you look closely, you can even see the wax capping down the side of the frame here. Next thing to look at is the side windows in your flow hive. So if you look at the side windows, you can see the wax capping on the frames. Now, this is the actual frame we're harvesting. So you can see the capping all the way across there that the bees are standing on. They're now starting to chew away to start the process again. But So I looked in the side window 
and noticed that the, the frame was capped and I looked in the, the rear window and noticed it was mostly capped and decided that was a good frame to harvest. Having said that, you can get into a situation where bees will get hungry and start eating out the centre of the frame down low, especially in some of the middle frames in the hive right above the brood nest. They use a fair bit of honey to, to raise their brood. They will, eat, they will need one frame of honey to raise one frame of brood. Brood are the baby bees. So if they get hungry, there's not much around, they'll start eating the centre out of the frame and the end can look full, yet you don't get as much honey out of the frame because they've eaten a portion out. So that's the only thing. If you're very observant, you'll be able to tell whether they're hungry or not and then start to, start to know when that could be happening in the center frames of your hive. And the way you do that is, is keep an eye on the pattern at the back here. If it's starting to look checkerboard where they're, where they're eating out honey cells and leaving other ones capped, then you know they're a bit hungry. If it's a nice filling pattern like this, where, where, where they're all filling kind of evenly, then that shows that the honey flow on. There's a honey flow on and the bees are, are, are likely to have the frames full in the center. So that was a long way to say, basically you look in the observation windows, you get to know what the bees do and you can then harvest good honey that'll keep on the shelf without having to open your hive. Catherine would like to know, should the core flute board go in the top or bottom slot? Um, they're in, she's in southwestern Victoria. So if you have a look at this hive down here, you can see that what she's talking about. The, the previous model, the Flow Hive Classic, has a core flute slider in the bottom instead of a tray like the new Flow Hive 2 has. So um, the reason why we, we made that core flute slider is it, it's to control the ventilation. So there's a screen bottom board and you can put it in the top to, to minimise ventilation if you want in colder times or you can move it down to get more ventilation and when you're honey harvesting we re recommend you put it at the top because if some honey spills in the hive, which it does sometimes, then it'll rest on the core flute and the bees can lick it up again through the, through the screen. So what you don't want is, is any honey kind of being exposed to other bees or, you, or they start coming and stealing that honey and you get into what's called a robbing scenario. So that's the function of the core flute slider. Put it in the top if it's getting cooler. Otherwise you can leave it in the bottom position or put it in the top when you're harvesting. Great questions. Keep them coming. Sean would like to know the pros and cons of feeding bees sugar water and can he continue feeding through spring if there isn't many flowers around? Okay, so feeding bees sugar water is something that's not a bad idea to do if your bees are really hungry. We don't have to do it in this area because there's always some flowers around. We're in a subtropical region. However, if we had a long cold winter, then we might choose to feed our bees prior to winter to make sure they have enough honey stores. There is other reasons why people feed bees and it could be to stimulate a lot of brood in the bottom box. So stimulate the queen to lay more eggs prior to a honey flow. So a commercial apiary might decide there's a big honey flow coming up and they want their hives to get a jump on that. They want enough bee numbers. They start feeding a quite a, a, a more runny solution of nectar, of, of sugar water. And what that does is simulate nectar flow coming into the hive. When there's a lot of nectar flow, the bees then start to lay more eggs because they try and throttle the size and numbers in the hive to what's going on around to make sure there's enough food for your for your colony. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions this morning. Jody would like to know when we put in a new nuke, how long before we can put the honey super on? So if you put a new uh, nuke in the bottom box sometimes it happens quick sometimes it happens slow just depending on uh, depending on the nectar flow at the time and the strength uh, genetics of your queen and how quickly she's going to lay so it can happen really quickly can happen uh, in a month later you're putting on the honey super 
staying behind the camera, had that experience, started his new colony. A, a, a month later he was harvesting from the honey super. It's unusual, it can take a bit longer. Um, in another scenario, they might not progress to a honey super that season because there's not enough nectar to do so. So um, that's sort of the spread like any, any agricultural pursuits. If you have more than one hive, that does increase your chances of getting a harvest. One hive might do extremely well and go extremely quickly, and another hive might be quite slow, and that's pretty normal. Robin would like to know how long do you harvest? Will it be time to stop? Will it be time to stop in summer? Harvest it only in spring, or how much should you leave for the bees? Okay, that depends a bit on your area. Here we can harvest all year round. There is times there might be a couple of months where there's not many flowers, and we will limit the harvesting. The flow hive does allow you to take one frame, get enough honey for your, for your family and, and leave the rest for the bees, which is, I think, a, a, an added bonus. It's sort of a different way to think about harvesting honey from hives. When I was uh, doing it in the conventional practices and selling honey to the shops, while I was in there, I'd always take it all because there's no point in doing all of that work just for a little bit of honey. Whereas a flow hive allows you to just harvest a little bit of honey and leave the rest for the bees. If you're unsure, leave some good honey for the bees, ask around with your beekeepers to say is there going to be an autumn flow coming up or, or whatever it is in your season. Um, and if there's not, you, if you're in extreme cold areas, you, you, you'll need to leave a whole box of honey for your bees to survive the winter. If you're in the, the, um, the less areas, then you might only need half a box. So it really depends on your area. You'll have to find that from your local beekeepers. Andrew has a lot of bees staying outside the entrance of the hive at night. Does he need to add another brood box for extra space? Okay, it's not necessarily the case. Um, the, but you, you could, like if it's hot, they'll often just stand at the entrance to basically uh, uh, allow room for ventilation in the hive. Um, but if they're really building up and starting to hang down off the their landing board, then that could be a sign they're going to swarm, in which case you might want to get a jump on that and take a split before they do so. Um, Stephen says it's three weeks since putting the nuke into the brood box in Adelaide Hills. Colony seems to be building strong enough <coughs> and they're building comb on the new frames, but is he's getting 20 to 50 chalk brood carcasses in the bottom tray each day. Okay, so, um, I'll just answer the last question because I didn't quite, yes you can add another super rather than taking a split to, to add more space in the hive or another brood box. Either one is common in beekeeping. You can have two, two brood boxes or, or two supers. So if you're getting chalk brood in your tray down the bottom, then, then um, you've got a case of chalk brood in your hive now. The, um, what you need to do, is the, often beekeepers will replace the, the queen in order to fix that problem because if you have hygienic genetics to deal with, with chalk brood, then they will just clean it out and get rid of it. So that's a common thing that uh, a beekeeper might do. Um, another Another thing people do, and this is experimental, and it's argued whether it does work or doesn't work, but I've definitely know beekeepers who say it does work, is you get a um, whole lot of bananas and you chop them up, and, and uh, you, you lift off the box, you put them on top of the brood frames. Now, <laughs> what that's said to do is, is basically be a, a, a scent, it's like an, a, a, similar to an alarm scent, and what the bees do is they they clean shop and they uh, allegedly pull out all the chalk brood. I haven't tried it myself and, and throw it out the front and that can be a way to, um, to get the hive to clean out all of those chalk brood and, and hopefully um, remedy that problem. Let us know how you go and see if that works for you. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Jenny's had her hive for 12 months and the bees were just starting to store honey in the super when they swarmed one and a half weeks ago and then again five days later. She managed to capture both swarms. Why would the hive swarm twice when there was still plenty of room in the super? Okay, that 
is basically genetic. Some hives are really quite swarmy, and and they um, they can swarm before they've even filled the super. We had we had a couple of hives like that once here, and they wouldn't even get to filling the back here, and they'd go up. Oh, time to swarm. Now. Um, Beekeepers typically try and find genetics that are less swarmy for that reason. They want to get full honey boxes. So, um, the, but each time they swarm, you're going to be getting new genetics because the new queen then, uh, in, that, that is raised in the hive to replace the old queen that left will be mating with new drones. So it could be the case that next time they're, they're less swarmy and um, they will fill your box. Let us know how you go. Okay, thank you uh, very much for all your great questions. There's, there is no such thing as a silly question. Um, the honey is still flowing out. There's a lot of honey in this frame. You can see this tube is still completely full. And we're up to our, our sixth jar. So we'll have, um, it looks like, perhaps eight jars from this frame. There's been a, a, a little bit of thixotropic honey in, in this from the leptospermum, so some medicinal properties as well, you can see by the way the honey's been behaving and the little globules that, that come out showing it's the, the jelly bush, the Australian manuka. Thank you for watching and see you again next week. If you've got more questions put them in the comments below and hopefully you get to have your questions answered and start in this wonderful world of beekeeping.